Test, testing, testing, testing. Okay. Robert, you're here. Oh, good. Oh, good. Thank you so much for coming all these weeks and watching the live stream. And this is our last class. And I guarantee that you'll be glad that you came tonight. We're going to look at some real cool things from John's Gospel. And uh, if you want to take the class for a grade, you can find a sheet on there that says the Gospel of John. You can fill it out. You don't have to do it tonight. Uh, you could always mail it in or hand it to me if you're here on a Sunday. If you don't come here, you could just mail it in or drop it at the office uh, if you want to complete it for a grade. Okay? We're going to begin tonight, <coughs> before we go to the Gospel of John, in Psalm 22. So turn to Psalm 22. And then we'll go to the Gospel of John. <coughs> Psalm 22. And you'll see some of the verses uh, in Psalm 22 mentioned in the Gospel of John when we go there. So Psalm 22 is where we'll begin. And let's first pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this night. Uh, Lord, thank you for the privilege that we have that we can just uh, calm our hearts and minds, clear our minds, and focus on your word. And we pray that you'll help us to do that now. And as we do that, that we'll be blessed as we learn more about you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Psalm 22 is a psalm of David, but there's a lot of messianic overtones in Psalm 22. So what I'm going to do briefly is I'm going to read Psalm 22, and then we're going to go to the Gospel of John. So look at Psalm 22. I'm going to read it slowly. Okay, Psalm 22. My God, you can, as I read it, picture uh, a crucifixion, uh, because that's, in a sense, what it's describing. David is describing his agony in his life, but he describes it in such a way that it typifies many of it, much of it, the Lord Jesus Christ. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from words of my groaning. Oh, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and you were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm, not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. 
Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for my for trouble is near, and there was no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions tear their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And they cast lots for my clothing. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers. I will, in the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he is not despised or disdained, the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme, praise, my theme, my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. So you've just heard that in reading that. Now turn with me to the Gospel of John. And as you turn to the Gospel of John, turn with me to John chapter 19. We're going to look at some passages that normally uh, maybe aren't looked at that much in f focusing on Jesus' death and, and uh, resurrection in the Gospel of John and some of the things that John wants to emphasize as he speaks about Jesus' death and the events that surround Jesus' death. So <clears throat> as we come in John chapter 19, uh, beginning uh, in, in verse 16, after Jesus met with Pilate, it says, finally Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Now, if we had more time and we looked carefully at the Gospel of John and the other Gospels, we, could, we would see, especially from Jesus' words in the Gospel of John, that no one takes him without him willingly giving up his will. Jesus willingly gave his life. Uh, he could have at any time, uh, you know, stepped away with all power that he had but he willingly gave his life for us on that cross. And so, uh, from a human perspective, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. So it says the soldiers took charge of Jesus, and carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Now, it's wonderful that we have four Gospels, right? And there's so many different things that are added in the different Gospels. And we see from one of the other Gospels that these two on, on each side of Jesus, what, what were their occupations? What were th They were thieves. They were criminals, right? And uh, the one hurled insults at Jesus. And the other one said what? Father, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What did Jesus say? Today you will be with me, where? In paradise. So there's no question as to where Jesus went after he physically died. He went into the presence of the Father. And uh, so 
Interestingly, John just says that he was crucified and with him two others, uh, one on one side and Jesus in the middle. Nine, verse 19 says, Pilate had a notice prepared, fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written Aramaic, Latin, and in Greek. The chief priests and the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Now, you've probably heard Pilate and the Jewish leaders did not get along. There was a lot of tension between the religious leaders, and it was very hard for Pilate to try to rule there with these Jewish leaders. Uh, he tried at times to squelch them, and they resisted. Uh, he sent eight, uh, soldiers at one point to try to, uh, you know, threaten to kill them. And rather than go back, they decided, the Jewish people decided there, that they would rather be killed. And so he was forced to withdraw and uh, he was, there was a real tension between him and the Jewish people. You can see that even when they came to him and what they said. And he tried to get, uh, you know, Jesus off in a sense, but uh, there was a lot of tension. So here he puts this sign up and it says, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And that certainly was true, but the Jewish leaders didn't like it. So in verse 23, uh, it says, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the un undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled which said they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Where is that scripture found? Well, Psalm 22. Now, see how perceptive you are. How many soldiers, how many soldiers were there? Does anybody know? How many soldiers were there? Yeah, how many were casting lots? There were four, right? We know there were four because look at them. They they said, it's not really, a, you thought it was, a, you were afraid to answer, right? You're afraid to answer. They took his clothing and divided into four shares, one for each of them, with the un undergarment remaining. And so uh, here we have, remember what I said in John, as we look through and read through John, we see contrast between uh, people who reject the gospel and harden their hearts and side by side with people who love Jesus and, and are there growing and want to, want to live for him. So here we have four soldiers. Certainly they don't know Christ. And they're casting lots for his garment. And John wants us to know this happened that the scripture might be fulfilled. Every scripture that would prophesied something about Jesus was fulfilled literally. And there are so many of them and so many references to scripture. And so John says, this is what the soldiers did. Now look what he says next. In contrast to four soldiers, here was four women who were at the cross of Jesus. Now, the other accounts mention that there were some women and mention their names, but only John gives us this little account uh, of what happened. And, of course, John was there. So it says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now stop there for a moment. Look at that verse carefully. Is anything in that verse unusual? Well, what do you notice about that verse? Just the naming of the names. And, and something else. Someone's not named. Now, if you were naming somebody normally, you would say, okay, Mary and Mary and Mary and whoever the other person is. 
but he just says his mother's sister. Why does he say his mother's sister? We know. We have a, we can, I can give you a good reason. John, it was John's mother. Salome. That was Salome. Salome. It was John's mother. John, John's mother, not John the Baptist. Yeah. It was John, the, the apostle John's mother. And in the Gospel of John, he never mentions anyone in his family by name. He mentions his brothers, but he doesn't mention them by name. He doesn't mention his name. Sometimes he refers to himself as the other disciple. Sometimes he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And here, he says, near the cross stood his mother, his mother's sister, Salome, his own mother, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now, I can't wait for Sunday because uh, <coughs> we have Resurrection Sunday. And as I'm looking in the Gospel of John and preaching through it, uh, who was the first person that Jesus appeared to in the resurrection? Mary Magdalene, who he had uh, done a marvelous work in her life. And so here's Mary Magdalene, and here's these women uh, at the cross. So when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Now, eventually, John went uh, off a bit, but for the next few years, as we see in the book of Acts, uh, he was in Jerusalem, and, and Jesus' mother was there. And so Jesus entrusted to the apostle John here um, the care of his mother as the oldest son. Now, why didn't Jesus entrust it to his own brothers and sisters? At this point, they had not yet believed. That was one reason, and also because John was related and uh, when did his own brothers finally believe? After the resurrection. We can't get into all the verses there, but they did not believe. But after the resurrection, then they believed in him. Right? And so James believed after he finally wrote a book of the Bible, right? And uh, so here he entrusts his mother. And then in verse 28, it says, later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that Scripture might be fulfilled. Now, all of the Gospel writers mention this, and Jesus focuses on Old Testament Scripture as well when he speaks. But here, John wants us to see that all the Scripture that the Old Testament prophesied about the Messiah was fulfilled in Jesus. And Jesus said, I am thirsty. Remember that uh, verse in Psalm 22, you know? And it says, a jar of wine vinegar was there, and they soaked a sponge and put it, on, put it on it and put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, and here it is, this marvelous cry, this completion of what Jesus did, beyond our full uh, comprehension of what it really means, Jesus cried. Actually, in the Greek, it's one word, te telestai. Uh, the, it is finished. The price has been paid. And then uh, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, the other Gospels tell us. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So it is finished. Christ has paid the price for the sin of the world through the shedding of his blood, that one time in history, that perfect sacrifice, all those sacrifices in the Old Testament from that point could never take away sin. And Jesus Christ, once for all, shed his blood, and for us he obtained eternal redemption. What a wonderful provision. Now, interestingly, so Jesus, <coughs> Jesus is on the cross and Jesus dies. Now, it's late on that Friday, 
And so John wants us to see now it was the day of preparation. The next day, uh, the day of preparation. And the next day was a special Sabbath. Why was it a special Sabbath? Because it was a Sabbath and it was what? Passover. Passover. So that's why it was a special Sabbath. And uh, because the Jews did not want bodies to be left on crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. Now, why would they break a person's legs? To die quicker. Uh, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't use your legs at all, and uh, so if you're alive, they'd break your legs, and then you'd suffocate quite quickly. And so why didn't the Jews want the bodies to be left on the cross during the Sabbath? Because a dead body uh, defiled the land. Now, normally, uh, the, the Romans would leave the bodies on the, cro on the crosses, and the birds would come and eat the flesh right off the, off the thing, and they used it, and they did that purposely so that people could see. And so they would leave the bodies on the crosses. But here, uh, he was not going to suffer decay on that cross, and it was a special Sabbath, and as a result, they uh, <coughs> wanted the legs broken. So the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then that of the other. So evidently, the two criminals were still living. It wasn't that they were physically stronger than Jesus, necessarily. It was that Jesus willingly, knowing that all was completed, gave up his life for the sin of the world. So when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with the spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Now look what John says. Remember how a witness is important in the Gospel of John? So now John says, the man who saw it. Who was the man who saw it? John has given testimony, and his testimony is true. It's another way of saying, I was there. I saw it. And then he says, he knows that he's telling the truth. And he testifies so that you also may believe. And then he says, these things happen so that Scripture would be fulfilled. The first one says not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Now, the first verse, there's a couple verses, uh, some two verses that refer to the Old Testament uh, sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb. His bones could not be broken. And Christ is our perfect Passover lamb. And then they shall look on the one they've pierced. Does anybody know where that verse comes from? No. No, close. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. It says this. And Zechariah, verse, it's, it's a double prophecy. It's really in the context of Zechariah, it's referring to the one day where the Jewish people will recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. Not only in the tribulation period, not only will God send two witnesses to witness to them, but he will ordain uh, 144,000 Jewish men as evangelists to go and share the gospel. And so many Jewish people will come to know Christ, and, and Jesus says they will look upon me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Now, interestingly, he says here, uh, he, he uses that verse and says there was a fulfillment here in this verse. They will look on the one they have pierced. And so as a result, uh, certainly Jesus was pierced. John says he saw it. And interestingly, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30, uh, it's worth your turning. Go to Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. Matthew 24, verse 30 says this, and, 
And at that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. This is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And look at this. And all the nations of the earth will mourn. That's the same verse where that comes from. And uh, it's, it's found in one more place. Look at Revelation 1 and verse 17. Revelation, the last book in the Bible. And look at chapter 1 and verse 17. Now, you should get here quicker than I do because I have one hand as I'm talking on the... Uh, look at Revelation 1.17. It says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then <coughs> he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. Uh, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Now that's 17. Go back to verse 7. It's supposed to be verse 7. That's a good verse. But look at verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples on the earth will mourn because of him. There certainly will be mourning for those who have never believed in Christ, right? There will be great, great mourning. And so go back to John. John specifically wants us to see that these things fulfilled Scripture. And so we can almost imagine John, as he's writing his account, thinking of these Old Testament Scriptures and then uh, creating and including the material where Jesus fulfilled these Old Testament passages. And then we already mentioned in verse 38, after this, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. So the Jewish people want the body of Jesus to be taken down, and everything had to be done quickly. It couldn't be that they just took the body down and had a dead body. The body had to be put in the tomb. And so it was getting late. Uh, at 6 p.m., uh, Passover began. And so, uh, you know, things had to move quickly. So Joseph of Arimathea it says, now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. Uh, tell me something else about Joseph of Arimathea. What do we know about him from the other accounts? He was ex very rich. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was very esteemed. And uh, so, and, and uh, so, and he was he was he hadn't yet declared himself outwardly as a disciple of Jesus Christ. But at this point, he did. Now, some think that maybe Jesus talked with him before and made arrangements for him to come. It's interesting that none of the disciples step forward. But here, Joseph of Arimathea steps forward and he is going to ask permission for the body of Jesus. Yeah, so there's a very possible reason why. Maybe if the disciples came, nobody would do anything. But there's no question the Jews wanted him off. Now, we know, and we'll see, you know, from Isaiah 53, it, there's a prophecy that is fulfilled here. What did they intend to do with Jesus' body? Now, if the bodies had to come off the cross, where did the other two criminals go? They went in a criminal's grave. They were thrown and quickly buried in a criminal's grave. Isaiah 53, verse 9, says they intended to put Jesus in a criminal's grave, but he was buried along with the rich. And so Joseph of Arimathea steps forward to, to ask for Jesus' body. Of course, we mentioned when we studied Nicodemus uh, that Nicodemus was there, too. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Now, it's one thing to just read this and say, oh, boy, th this is really something what they did. As you put all the four counts together, uh, the Gospel of Luke, I believe, tells us that they were the ones who took Jesus down from the cross. 
And so as I read that, you know, I, I sort of felt like, wow, can you just imagine? Here are these two, two members of the Sanhedrin. Um, and it says, it says also about Joseph that he did not consent in their decision to put Jesus to death. And so Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, I can't imagine, you know, taking Jesus and taking him off the cross, right? Just imagine the physical uh, thing. This is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. So they took him from the cross. Uh, you know, how they got the nails out, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, how they got him off. But they got him off the cross, and they took him quickly and it says here, <coughs> Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices <coughs> and uh, in strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial custom. And the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in that garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Whose tomb was that? Joseph's tomb. He had, he had made that for himself. And so he probably owned the garden. He was very wit, rich. And so he came and took Jesus' body, and Jesus was put in that tomb because it was a Jewish day of preparation. And since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus' body there. Now, <coughs> Here was Jesus in the tomb, and I'm sure uh, it must have been a sad time as they rolled that stone. Maybe they had help. They had that stone. They rolled in front of that tomb, and, uh, but they were not the only ones there. Uh, we, don't, we don't see from John who else is at the tomb, but who else was at the tomb? There were two women, Mary and Mary Magdalene. They were still there, right? So uh, then, of course, uh, in, in the next account, in, ver in chapter 20, uh, we have the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's just an amazing account, right? And in John chapter 20, he next appears to Mary Magdalene. And then he appears to all the disciples. Of course, when we put it all together, we see that very early after uh, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, he appeared to Peter. And then to James and some of the other disciples. And then uh, a week later, notice it says here in verse 26, a week later of chapter 20, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And then he appeared to Thomas. He waited a week. Thomas hadn't seen him. It's a striking meeting, right? Where Jesus says, look at my hands. Put your hands in my side. Do not be doubting, but believe, right? Wow. Whew. This was the greatest miraculous sign that Jesus did. And so there, <coughs> Jesus, there John says in verse 30, Jesus did many other miraculous signs, the greatest being his resurrection in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. <coughs> Look at chapter 21. I want us to look at that. It simply says, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, right? Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two other disciples. Now, one of them was the Apostle John, we know that, who wrote the book. Who the other one was, I'm not sure. And it says in verse 3, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. You have to love the way John writes because he's communicating more than what is just written there. So here we have the disciples, and they see Jesus. He has not yet ascended, right? And uh, they, they know that he's risen from the dead, but he's not there physically. And so we get from what John writes here a sense of purposelessness, right? 
Now, they had given up the fishing business. Remember earlier, they had thrown the boats and said, that's it, put the boats on the shore, put the nets, and said, okay, we're going to now follow Jesus. But now Jesus is no longer there. And so there's a sense of purposelessness in terms of direction when John records, I'm going out to fish. In other words, okay, where do we do now? What do we do? Jesus is no longer here. And the other disciples say, we'll go with you. And they went out, got in the boat. That night, they caught what? Nothing. Isn't that, isn't that quite striking how John writes that? Now, <coughs> you might remember a few years earlier, something similar happened. And they fished and caught nothing. And then Jesus said, throw the net in the other side of the boat. And they caught a thing. And then Peter said, go away from me. I am a sinful man. But that was a couple years ago. So now they get in the boat. Now look at the next verse. Early in the morning. So all night they've been fishing. They caught nothing all night. Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. It could have been misty for whatever reason. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? <laughs> now, one thing you don't ask a fisherman is, did you catch any fish? Because if he catches it, he probably won't say yes anyway, because he doesn't want you fishing there. And, uh, but anyway, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. Throw the net on the other side, right side of the boat, and you'll find some. If you were in the boat, what would you be thinking? I don't know. Yeah, maybe, maybe you're thinking maybe he can see fish from his vantage point there or something. I don't know. Doesn't say. But it says when they did, they were unable to hold the net in because of the large number of fish. <clears throat> Now, just imagine yourself being in that boat. I don't know what the conversation was about all night. Uh, they, I'm sure they were talking about things as they were sitting there. There was no fish. And as they heard the man from the shore yell, throw the net in the right side, for whatever reason, they did it. And all of a sudden, the net was filled with fish. So look at verse 7. <clears throat> then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. <laughs> this, was, <clears throat> this was his mark. He had done this before. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he, he, from our perspective, things seem so easy, but sitting in the boat, it probably wasn't quite as easy. I can imagine they were very discouraged, you know. Uh, and certainly they didn't even think that that person on the shore was Jesus. But right away, John knew. So it says here, as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. And the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. So they're about a football field length away from the shore. It's kind of a humorous scene where Peter jumps out of the boat, but he doesn't seem to get to the shore any quicker than the, the other disciples get there with the net. And it says <coughs> here, um, the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals where there were fish on it and some bread. Now, isn't this incredible? Here you have Jesus, the Son of God, the creator of the universe, the one who died for their sins, and he's made them breakfast, right? And uh, uh, they come in. They haven't eaten all night. They were hungry. And uh, Jesus said, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of fish, 
Eventually, they counted them, so they knew how many were there, 153. Pretty good catch. But even with <coughs> so many, f the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. In other words, come and fellowship with me. Come and spend time with me. Now, <coughs> what a breakfast it must have been. Uh, Jesus must have talked with them. They were stunned. None of the disciples dare ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Now, isn't that interesting that he served them? He took the bread and he gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. Now, <coughs> this was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. But that's not the end of the story. Look at this in verse 15. When they had finished eating, so here they have fellowship with Jesus. They're talking with him. They're eating with him. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. Now, it's interesting that Jesus refers to Simon not as Peter, but as Simon. Remember early on, several years, he said, you're going to be called Peter, the rock. But I guess he wasn't the rock yet. And he refers to him as Simon, son of John. Do you truly love me more than these? Who are the these that he is talking about? I don't think so. I don't think it's the people. I, do you think that Jesus would say, do you love me more than these other disciples? I don't think he'd say that. I think he's talking about the fish and the net <laughs> and the fishing stuff. And I think what he's saying is, do you love me more than these? In other words, the future for you is not going to be in fishing. The future for you is going to be in serving me. Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Now, in the, Engl in the Greek language, there are four words for love. Uh, three of them, I think only two of them are really in the Bible. Uh, one is storge, that's a family love. One is eros, uh, that is a sensual love and physical love. Neither one of those are in the Bible. The other two <coughs> are uh, agape, which is God's perfect love. And then philios, like from the city of Philadelphia, brotherly love. Now, interestingly, there's different words that are used here. It's hard to know exactly why we could surmise. But when <coughs> Jesus says, Simon, Simon, son of John, do you truly agape me more than these? <coughs> Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I filio you. So he uses a different word for love. Jesus says, feed my lambs. You know what Jesus is saying? Take care of my children. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly agape me? Jesus answered, yes, Lord, you know that I filio you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. In other words, this was a new task. Interestingly, Peter denied Jesus three times, and here Jesus asks him this three times. The third time Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you filio me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you filio me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I filio you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And then, then he told him, I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you are not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, these words must have been so powerful because these are the words that he said several years earlier. Then he said to him, follow me. Right? Powerful, powerful words. Now, tradition tells us that Peter died hanging on a cross upside down because he didn't want to be crucified like his Lord. But isn't this interesting that you would think that being the disciples, God would spare them 
the pain of physical death and martyrdom. But he didn't. And actually, it even says that he shared with him the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said, follow me. Yeah. You know, I used to have some some things I would say about why the change of loves, and that's the question. But I don't really I don't really think so. I, I maybe Peter realized he he hadn't that that perfect love at this point. I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, if I lived at that time, there would be maybe not quite the distinction. Sometime we put between those words, but clearly they were two different words that are used. And I'm sure you could come up with some suggestions, and I have some others, but I hesitate because I'm not quite sure, but Jesus said that. So look at what Jesus says. Uh, You know, (coughs) um, Jesus answered, uh, so it says in verse 20, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper, and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? <laughs> what about him? You know, you just told me about Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is this to you? You must follow me. In other words, there has to be clarity of purpose. God has a different purpose for everyone. And then he says this, Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. John says, but Jesus didn't say he wouldn't die. Not only if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is it to you? Isn't that interesting? Jesus says, if I want him to remain alive, what? Until I return. He is going to return, and people are going to be alive when he comes. And then John says, this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Perhaps the we there is the disciples, some of the other disciples, just like we would write or I would write sometimes on behalf of the church. What's your position on this? Well, we believe this, speaking not only for me, but also in terms of as a church, we believe this. So John says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that not even the whole world would have enough room for the books that would be written. Isn't that wonderful? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for all that we have in you. We just praise you for your word. Uh, Just encourage our hearts with all that we have in you. And may we too follow you. And uh, Father, we love you and thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, thank you so much for coming. Uh, God bless you. Hopefully you'll come back in the fall. That's when our classes will resume. If you want to hand your sheet in, you can hand it in, or you can mail it in, or you can mail it in next week or month.